Sometimes, you know, prayer feels perhaps as though we're just talking to ourselves or we're just rehearsing something for our own benefit. Who's listening? Is anybody listening? Is God listening? tired and drained, and think you lack the resources to live the Christian life? In this series, Ephesians, Resources and Responsibilities, Charles Price shares with us how Christ is sufficient to meet every spiritual need we have. God has not promised to remove all the problems from our lives, but to be with us and strengthen us as we face them. Today's message is Praying for the Fullness of God. I'm going to read to you this morning from Ephesians chapter 3. We've been looking in Ephesians for a number of weeks, and I want to read you this morning from Ephesians 3 verse 14 down to verse 21, which is a prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians and one that I want to look at with you. Let me read from verse 14. He says, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure 
of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Please keep your Bible open there. There's a saying, if you want to embarrass a Christian, ask him or her about their prayer life. And I fall into that embarrassed category, and probably many of us here do. A lot of us find it very difficult. How much time do you spend praying? And what do you pray about? And how often do you pray it? And does it make any difference anyway? Lady came to me after the first service this morning and she thanked me for what we had talked about today and she said, you know, I haven't prayed for quite a while. I said, why is that? She said, because I prayed that my marriage would not break up. It was under threat and it did break up. My daughter became ill. I prayed that she would get better and she died. She said, I gave up praying because nothing ever seemed to change because of it. And I wonder if some of us here this morning identify with that. Does it really make any difference? The Barna research team did a survey in the United States. It was a survey on people's prayer life and they discovered that 82% of adults and 89% of teenagers pray in a normal week. So by the way, if you ever are tempted to feel discouraged about teenagers, they're praying more than the rest of us. That's good. Of those numbers, 88% of women pray in a typical week, 75% of men. What's wrong, men? Are we self-sufficient, I wonder, or think we are? When they pray, 95% thank God for what he's done in their lives. 76% ask for forgiveness for specific sins. 67, that's two-thirds, spend time in prayer, worshiping God and praising him for his attributes. 82% of people believe that prayer can change what happens in a person's life. And you read those Statistics, and they're very encouraging. Most of them are in the 80s, 80% 80 of people who pray and ask forgiveness and thank God and worship God and believe that change comes as a result. But then it's rather intriguing in the light of that to see that the average prayer lasts less than five minutes. So you don't spend a lot of time investing in these good things. And sometimes, you know, prayer feels perhaps as though we're just talking to ourselves or we're just rehearsing something for our own benefit. Who's listening? Is anybody listening? Is God listening? We reason God is very busy. I am one of six billion people on this planet. My issues are minuscule compared to the big issues of life, perhaps. Where do I fit if there's ever an order of priorities? C.S. Lewis, who so often has profound insight into things, has a book called Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer. And he talks about the skeptics who mock the idea of prayer. And he says, he writes there, they tell me, Lord, it's, it's a prayer that he writes, they tell me, Lord, that when I pray, only one voice is heard, that I'm dreaming and you are not there and that this whole thing is absurd. Then he writes this, maybe they are right, Lord, that when I pray, only one voice is heard. But it is not my voice. It is yours. You see, what is prayer? Prayer is, we might say it at its simplest, it's the 
talking part of the relationship that we have with God. But although it's a talking part of the relationship, and therefore it's two-way, we discover in Scripture prayer is responsive to God. If prayer is the talking part, the first time God talked to man in the Bible was in the Garden of Eden, and he asked a question, where are you? And the answer, an answer came back. And prayer is our response to the initiatives of God. And I say that because Paul's prayer here is a response to the truth he has been explaining to the Ephesians about God, which is why he begins this prayer, verse 14, saying, for this reason I kneel before the Father Etc. For what reason? This reason, that which I've been talking about. The fact that although we have been by nature separated from God, he goes back into chapter 2, aliens without God, without hope, Gentiles over here, Jews over here, we've been brought together into one body that has been united in Jesus Christ. And he says, for this reason, now that you're one body, I'm praying something that you need to experience from God and only can experience from God that brings all I've been teaching you into experiential knowledge and life for you. He prayed earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, and again, verse 14, when he starts that prayer, he says, for this reason, and he prays a prayer that is, praying into the hearts of his listeners, his readers, the truths he's been teaching them. That Paul prays a number of times in his letters, and they're never random prayers. He is praying home the truths that he's been talking about. You look at the prayers in Scripture, and you'll find that to be true. Jesus' great prayer in John 17 is praying home for his disciples, that which he's taught them in John 13, 14, 15, and 16, when they're all together in the upper room. The Lord's Prayer, as we call it, that Jesus taught his disciples, the first half is all about God. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And he's halfway through that short prayer, and he's never mentioned the people, never mentioned their need. He does so in the light of first establishing your kingdom, your will, and the nature of God himself. And in the light of that, you pray. And that means this, that when God teaches you things, and when we meet together like this, and we open the word of God, and we trust the spirit of God instructs us, the spirit who inspired this book is the one who interprets it to our hearts as we hear it and read it, I hope you take time to pray it into your experience. Pray it into your life. That's what Paul's doing here. I want to ask three questions to understand this prayer. I'm going to ask the questions, who is he praying to? What is he praying for? And why does he need to pray about it anyway? Me first. Who is he praying to? I want you to notice two things that come here. First of all, in verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. Notice this, he is kneeling before the Father from, from whom everything derives. Notice the two things here. Paul's posture of humility. I kneel. That is a posture of humility. And God's position of supremacy. I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. He acknowledges the supremacy of God, the sovereignty of God, and the sufficiency of God. And the juxtaposition between these two things, Paul's posture of humility, 
and God's position of supremacy is important to effective praying. We don't come to God carrying a set of rights on the basis of which we're going to insist on certain things. We come before God in humility, not demanding, but submitting. If we demand, we have not come to God trusting. Another person asked me this morning if I'd pray for them, and I said, what particular need do you have in mind? When somebody asks you to pray, they normally have a particular need. He said, I have a job interview tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. I said, what do you want me to pray for? She said that I get the job. I said, well, I hope you do, but I'm not going to pray that for you. What I'd like us to do is to present tomorrow morning to God and ask that his will will be done in this and that your life, your presence, your interview will be a time when something of the Lord Jesus in you is seen by those who interview you. You'd like to pray that way? She said, yes, I'd love to pray that way. <laughs> so we prayed. I hope she gets the job. But you see, we're coming to God saying, Lord, for me, this looks like the answer. And if it is the answer, it will be the answer. But if it's not the answer, I'm trusting you. Because our posture in prayer is the posture of humility in order that God in his sovereignty and sufficiency and supremacy can work out his will and his way in our lives. That's the first thing I want you to notice. I kneel and it's before the Father. The second thing I want you to notice is in verse 16, he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Now, the New International Version, which I'm using, translates this poorly because the word they translate as two words, out of, I pray that out of his glorious riches, is the word kata in the Greek New Testament that literally means according to or in accordance with. The King James, for instance, says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may strengthen you. The ESV says that according to the riches of his glory, in fact, most translations accurately translate that according to his riches. You say, why are you making a fuss about that? I'll tell you why. Because if we are asking God out of his riches... We're asking him very differently to if we're asking him according to his riches. You see, a multi-millionaire might give out of his riches and give you 25 cents. That's come out of his riches. But if a multi-millionaire gives according to his riches, it's a lot more than 25 cents. Now he says, though the NIV misses the point, but now he says that I'm praying that according to his riches, whatever we're going to ask for. Hanley Mole, who's an old writer, says according to means on the scale of and in the style of. In other words, I pray that on the scale of his glorious riches and in the style of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. I tell you, this gives confidence. We are coming to God and saying, God, as I intercede, I'm asking you in accordance with your glorious riches. Well, what, what are his glorious riches about? What are they like? Well, earlier in the same chapter, chapter 3, verse 8, he talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. So whatever the glorious riches of Christ are, Paul has already said they're the unsearchable riches. In other words, we can't quantify them. And however much you might try to estimate what his riches are, they are exceeded. We're not talking about material things, by the way. They're exceeded because they're unsearchable. 
And I love this phrase, according to. It's the same phrase that Paul used in Philippians 4.19 when he said, God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. A very similar phrase that he says, so that God will meet your needs, not out of the 25 cents, but he'll meet according to that whatever are the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ, he will meet you in accordance with his resources. So what in the world then? Is he asking for? Because we're not coming to empty coffers. We're coming to a richness. This is unsearchable. And we're coming in humility that the supreme and sovereign and sufficient God is totally capable of meeting us in this area of need. What's he praying for? Well, again, there are two things he prays for. The first is he prays for strength in verse 16. He says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, this should be no surprise, because when you read the doctrinal sections of Scripture and you read what God has for us, and you read what God wants to do in us, and what God wants to do for us, and what God wants to do through us, and all the things that he expects to be the consequence of that in our lives, as we explore the truths of God, we, we come to the realization, this is utterly impossible to me, apart from being strengthened by God. The more we explore the truths of God, the more we realize our need for divine strength. In fact, I'll put it this way, we cannot separate divine enterprise from divine enabling. This is one of the big mistakes we make. We see the divine enterprise. This is what God wants to do. This is the plan of God. Okay, we'll try and do it. We can't. We can never fulfill the divine enterprise without the divine enabling. And that's why some of us get discouraged and some of us even give up. You know, we, we read the word of God or we listen to it explained on Sunday morning like this and we respond by saying, well, that's all very well, but. And we begin to think or describe about how unrealistic this is, how impractical this is, how difficult this is, how impossible this is, about how our history doesn't help me with this. And it's all very well, you might say, for the preacher to get up there and talk about these things, but you don't know how hard it is for me. Good. I'm glad you think that way. Because unless we understand that for every divine demand, we need divine dynamic. For every divine enterprise, we need divine energy and enabling. For every divine strategy, we need divine strength. We're never going to live the Christian life. We're simply going to religionize Christianity and make it a, a religion and a set of rules that we do our best to implement. And you can't do that. Unless there is supernatural involvement in our lives, we cannot live this way. God called you to be a witness? The answer is he has. Well, then you need his strength. That's why Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. Don't, don't start in the middle of that verse and say, well, I'm going to be a witness. In fact, in the previous chapter, Acts chapter 1, that's not the previous chapter, a couple of verses before, he said, do not leave Jerusalem until you have received power from on high. In other words... Don't run out and try to fulfill the divine strategy if you haven't received the divine strength first. Seek the enabling of God by his Holy Spirit. Has God called you to live a holy life? Yes, he has. How are you going to do that? Only by his indwelling strength. Back in our homes, in our workplace, in every sphere of life, we need his strength. So Paul says, 
from this posture of humility, kneeling before the Father, and confident that it is according to his glorious riches that I'm praying, he says, that he may strengthen you, and then he tells you how, with power through his spirit in your inner being. This strengthening is going to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's in your inner being. The Holy Spirit takes his place, you see, in the inner being of our lives. Be very careful of being taken up with the outer activity. The outer activity is symptomatic of the inner workings of God in our lives. We can put on the outer activities. We can produce with a little bit of discipline and smart, thoughtful living, we can produce an effect on the outward but it won't be real, and in our off-guarded moments, we'll discover we don't have the resources in the inner man to maintain the outer. And the outer activity derives from the inner being being strengthened. So I'm praying for, that you may be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being. And interestingly, Paul is writing this from a context where he is in prison. In verse 13, he said, I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings which for you, which are for your glory. So he is suffering, and he's suffering in prison. Back in chapter 3, verse 1, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Chapter 4, verse 1, as a prisoner for the Lord, he is in prison, which means that as a prisoner, his outer being has been locked up and restricted and put into chains. His outer being is restricted, but his inner being is being renewed and strengthened. You know, Paul was often in trouble. In fact, I take that back. He was always in trouble. And when he wrote this second letter to the Corinthians, one of the things he said in that letter was, I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 lashes, 39 stripes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. And he goes on to give a whole catalog of things that follow that. Paul knew a lot about his outer being being restricted and under pressure and being persecuted and suffering. So how in the world did he cope? He coped because his inner being was being renewed all the time. Because he says to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Yet, inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. That's why he's praying for the Ephesians, that you will know you will be strengthened with his power through his spirit in your inner being, because outwardly, there'll be all kinds of winds and waves and difficulties and problems, but the strength of the spirit of God is not seen in those waves calming or the wind stopping blowing. No, you might live in the midst of horrendous circumstances and God may not take you out of those circumstances. The daughter may die as that lady this morning. Where's the strength of the spirit? In your inner being, the ability to live in that situation. See, how could Paul sing in a prison in Philippi with a bleeding back from the whips with which he'd been lacerated. I'll tell you how. Because whilst the outer man was taking a beating, his inner being was being renewed by the Spirit. How could he in Lystra when he says he was stoned and he was stoned and left unconscious on the ground, presumably in a pool of his own blood. They left him assuming him to be dead, but he wasn't and he regained consciousness. He got up, he went back into the city. How did Paul do that? Because while the stones were bashing and crushing the outer man, his inner man was being renewed by the Spirit. How could he cope with all the opposition and criticism with which he was faced? Because while the tax was being made on the outer man, his inner being was being renewed by the Spirit. And I want to ask you this morning, do you know this in your own life? Or does every outward attack throw you? I want to pretend we don't suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as Shakespeare put it. We do. But in the midst of it, are we being renewed in our inner being through the word of God and by the spirit of God? 
And you may be having a tough journey this morning, maybe this last week, and your outer being feels pushed around and bashed around. But I ask you, how's your inner being? This is the prayer of Paul. He will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's where you find strength to be operative. And how is this strength going to be experienced? He goes on, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This is not some impersonal power. Sometimes we're in danger of thinking of the power of God being an impersonal power like, like electricity. If you plug into it, bzzz, and there's power. Or like gasoline you put in your car and enables the car to function with power. No, this power of the Spirit in your inner being is the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we do, of course, have to be careful of making too much distinction between the indwelling spirit of Christ and the indwelling of Christ by his spirit. Scripture does speak of them differently, but we have to be a little careful of making too much distinction. There may be emphasis of meaning in a context where it speaks of Christ in you and another when it speaks of the spirit in you. It's very interesting here in Ephesians that Paul speaks about being filled with the whole of the Trinity because here in chapter 3, verse 19, he says that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. It's the fullness of God. Next chapter, chapter 4, verse 13, he talks about attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So now it's the fullness of Christ. Next chapter, chapter 5, he says, be filled with the Spirit. So he talks about the fullness of God, the fullness of Christ, and being filled with the Spirit. Now, are these three different fullnesses? Can you say, well, I am filled with God today, but I'm not filled with the Spirit. Or I'm filled with the Spirit, but I'm not filled with Christ. Or I'm filled with Christ, but not filled with God. No, of course not. It is the fullness of the Godhead. But sometimes when we talk about the Spirit, if we are in danger of detaching the Spirit from the historical Jesus, we might begin to think of the Spirit in a way that is too vague, too ethereal. Or, on the other hand, we might think of the Spirit in some kind of uh, unrestrained power, like I just said, like a lightning bolt or an electricity charge. And neither of those is helpful. We need to think of the Spirit in terms of Jesus of Nazareth, who we do know, who did walk this earth, who lived, who was kind, who behaved in certain ways, who cared for the underdog, who acted in such a way that we know that the Spirit who lives in us, the life of Jesus, is living that life within us. It's nothing ethereal. It's a life that walked dusty roads and interacted with real people. And so I'm praying that God will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being that Christ may dwell in your hearts and you'll see the Trinity together there. He's praying to the Father from whom all the names of heaven and earth derive. He is praying that they'll know the power of the Spirit, and he's praying the result will be that Christ will dwell in your hearts. The people meeting you will not meet something spiritual. It's very trendy to be spiritual these days. Spirituality is in. It's not spirituality. It's Christ. Lived in us by the Holy Spirit. And so that's the first thing he's praying for, strength. You'll be strengthened by power through his spirit that Christ will live in your hearts. And the second request is in verse 17, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. The second request is for love. And that is logical because if the strengthening of us by the spirit is that Christ may live in our hearts. The chief characteristic of Jesus Christ is that he is love. 
Now, notice some of the language Paul uses here. He speaks of being rooted and established. Some translations, rooted and grounded in love. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit being love, but we must understand that fruit has its origin in root. And we need to be rooted in love. That's why we can be fruited. Did I invent that word? <laughs> by love. We're fruited by love because we're rooted in love. We're never going to love well until we know that we are loved. It's out of being loved that we are able to love. My wife, Hillary, talks sometimes about resting in her belovedness. The fact that I'm beloved by God, I'm loved by God, I'm his beloved. But some of us don't know that. We know it as a theory, perhaps. And Paul says, I'm praying that your roots will go down into his love and that leads me to the last point, which we'll say more about this. And the last point is, why does he need to pray about this anyway? What I mean by that is, why doesn't he just teach it? Why doesn't he just teach it? Why does he need to pray about it anyway? Thirdly, it's for this reason. Go back to read from the middle of verse 17. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Listen and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Do you pick up the paradox there, the contradiction in terms there, that you may know this love that surpasses knowledge? How can you know something that surpasses knowability? Another new word. Here's a very important thing that Paul is saying here. There's some things you cannot know only intellectually by having been given the knowledge. You see, if our dealings with God are purely on a rational level, it's purely a result of intellectual processing, of reading, of listening, of thinking, of understanding, we might understand a very full theory and doctrinal position that the scripture gives to us, but we'll come to a point where we come up against a barrier that says there's got to be more than just knowing this this way. There's some things which have to go beyond intellectual processing. And the reason why Paul prays for this, I suggest to you, is not that you'll grasp everything I've said and you'll get hold of what I've been talking about and that you're smart enough you understand anyway. No, I'm praying for you because you've got to go beyond anything another human being can give you. I can give you information. I can show you where to find information. I can give you doctrinal truths. I can give you the facts. But there's something you need to know that surpasses knowledge. That is, it surpasses purely intellectual exercise. And that is that you come into an experiential knowledge of the love of God. You see... If we only know the things that we hear and read, if your Christian life is basically a diet of coming to church here on Sunday morning, listening to whoever's preaching, getting a bit more information, reading your Bible, reading a few Christian books, maybe going to a Bible study, but you don't go beyond that to deal with God himself, personally, It will all be true, and you'll believe it, but you won't be excited by it. You will understand the Christian life to be able to explain to somebody else, but Christ won't be central when you get out of the Christian environment. Go back to your home, workplace. 
Paul wrote in Romans 5, verse 5, that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. That something the Holy Spirit does, and therefore it is beyond that which is natural. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. He pours the love into our hearts in such a way that you know that you're loved by God. You know because you know because you know and you can't prove it to anybody else. You can't explain to anybody else. Some of us are content with a purely intellectual Christianity where we affirm the truths that we must affirm that are objectively true. But we know little of that which in our lives is explicable only by the work of the Holy Spirit. As Christ lives in us, as he says, that Christ may live in your hearts by faith and that you will know this love that surpasses knowledge. In Ephesians 1, Paul's other prayer in this letter, he uses a great phrase in verse 18 of Ephesians 1, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. It's a great phrase. Not the ears of your mind, but the eyes of your heart that you see something beyond what the mind itself can fathom and discover. There's only one reason to pray, and that is to move us beyond the natural and the material and the physical and the predictable to the sphere in which God alone can operate. That's what Paul does here. Because you see, his teaching all the way through is about that which is only possible when God himself is operating and working. So his praying inevitably is the same. And here's the result in the second part of verse 19. So that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. I suggest to you, without time to go into all the reasoning for this, the fullness of God, I suggest to you, speaks of the fullness of his moral character in us. We were created to be in the image of God. That's his moral image. The way we live and act demonstrates what God's character is like. He's loving and kind and good. And I'm praying for you that you may be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man so Christ will live in your hearts so that you may know the love that surpasses knowledge and you be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, that the result of this is that the very character of God is seen again in us. He talked about the fullness of God earlier in this letter, chapter 1, verse 23, where he says about the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That is, the church is the place where God chooses to do his work and through whom he does his work. That is his fullness in an objective sense. It's objectively true. God's presence and working in this world is through his church. But here in a subjective sense, that you may know that which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, that his image, his character is being seen in us. Is that what you're praying for when you bring with your list of things? It's valid to bring our list of things to God. But what is the end result of that list of things? Is that I know God better through this? Because sometimes we're asking for the very opposite thing. We say, Lord, make this in my life easier. And the reality is, that the very difficulty is going to be the thing which teaches us to know God and brings us to know God in a better way than we ever did before. Now let me ask, does this seem out of reach? Is this one of those sermons again where you go home and say, well, it's all very well. Huh. I get caught up in it in church. and Wow, it's great. But I get back to the reality of life two hours later and this is not real realistic at all. Well, if you're thinking that, that's good. But we haven't finished the prayer yet. Because in verse 20, 
he says this. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to, same word, kata, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So he, he prays this, says, now, listen, I imagine who we're praying to. We're praying to the one who can do all that we ask or imagine? No. What we're asking and imagining is big enough. Huh. Immeasurably more. Because it's in accordance with his power that is at work within us. Again, he takes it back. Stop trying to apply this in terms of what you can do. If it's what you can do, if it's going back and saying, well, I'll try it a little bit harder this week than I did before. I'll make another dedication of my life to God, so I promise him. No. You'll be back where you were. Keep your eyes on Jesus. This is his business. This is his work. This is what he alone can do. And whatever you ask for, he is capable of more than we ask. Whatever we imagine, he's capable of more than we can imagine. And that's why this prayer is with confidence. Because Paul's praying, like his teaching, always takes you back to dependence upon Jesus, always takes you back to what he will do in you and for you and through you. That is the place of our dependence, the place where we, we get beyond ourselves. Let me put the whole thing together. His prayer is in a posture of humility. I bow the knee, knee. Now, if we don't get that right, the rest will not follow. It's in that position of humility. I bow the knee before the Father. I, in my humility, recognize my utter dependence on a God who is the Father from whom everything derives. So he's sovereign. He's sufficient. So there's no lack in the God I'm coming to. The lack is all in me. So I'm coming in dependence, bowing the knee before him, and I'm praying for strength because every divine enterprise requires divine energy. I'm praying for strength by the Spirit so the Christ will live in my heart and that I will know this love. I'll be rooted in it, grounded in it. My roots are in it, so the fruit comes from it. It's a love that I will know something of its height and length and breadth and depth. But beyond that, that we might know something that surpasses knowledge, we move out of simply an intellectual categorizing of these things to a spiritual experience of these things. As God himself pours his life and his love into us. So one of the reasons why Jesus said, when you pray, Matthew 6, go to your room and close the door and deal with God alone. And if your Christian experience is through, only through the church, only through some community, only through some fellowship group, only through some Christian friends, but there's no time in which you're dealing with him alone, talking to him, hearing him, loving him, being loved by him, and going beyond that which can be known to that which surpasses knowledge and experiencing his love poured out in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Unless we are living that way, unless we are seeking that fellowship and union with him, we'll dot the I's and cross the T's and agree with the doctrines, but let's get this church service over and let's get back home and do something useful because it'll be cold. And as for mission, well, I'll put my money for that. Man, I have nothing to offer people except some words.
And the greatest need in our church is not for new strategies, though we need and do think about that. It's not for new structures. Those have to be reviewed every once in a while. It's for fresh empowering by the Holy Spirit that makes Jesus live in our hearts in such a way that his character is seen, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith and will be rooted in his love and will be fruited with his love. It'll flow out. And the God who is doing this and will do this in you is a God who will do immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine. May I recommend that you take time, not just this week, but let's do it this week. Let's do it for the first time, some of us. To make time alone with God, not in a vacuum, in his word. Read it. Respond to it. Open your heart to him, love him. And the problem with those prayers I mentioned at the beginning was they were all done in less than five minutes. There was no time to hear back, (laughs) to receive back, because you're up and off. Wait on God. And some of us need to go beyond the knowledge, intellectual knowledge area, to experience presence and love and grace of God in a way which is deep within our hearts. Let's ask God to make that real. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every man and woman and young person in this building this morning. Thank you for your wonderful grace and calling us to yourself. And we realize as we look back that the day we came to Christ, we had such little idea of the vastness of the gospel and its outworking in our lives. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we will not be content with sitting where we sit and being where we are, but we will move on in God to know things and experience in our heart your presence that manifests itself in the fullness of God, in the fullness of that character which expresses your presence in us. Lord, we reach the end of what we can do and think and we plead with you to take us beyond into an experiential knowledge of God Make this true for us personally. Make it true for us as a church. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 